right so um, pam thank you very much for doing this for us Welcome back to the metaforum and uh, i'm very excited i'm very happy to see you um, presenting your work to the metaforum i think that this work is uh, very special and very good and very useful for us to have a an interesting discussion so um, it's all yours. Um, the usual question, would you prefer to do the presentation without interruption and then have questions or are you happy to be interrupted during the presentation? Happy to be interrupted. I'd rather have it be a conversation. Okay, great. Well, okay, okay so it's all yours. Okay. You I don't know if you want to introduce yourself for people who don't know about you, just briefly. Okay. Um, yeah, so Pam um, um 30 years in a national laboratory in the United States doing um, pretty hard systems, predictive modeling, integrated modeling. And um, after a career of that, um, I felt like we never really got anywhere with all of that. Um, a lot of money spent, a lot of effort put into it, and it very rarely gets used. Um, so uh, late in my career, I discovered system science um, through being at a conference where I met Gerald Midgley um, and got so excited about it that I decided I came home, told my husband I'm going to get a PhD. And he said, well, okay. <laughs> so I'm doing a remote um, part-time PhD with Hull. And so um, um, Angela is my second advisor and she's been awesome in making what started out to be quite scary. Yes. Um, really not scary and, and, and marvelous. So thank you for that. And, um, and basically, I guess what I want to emphasize is my experience has always been very practical. So I'm, I love learning the theory and I love even, you know, digging deep into this, but when it comes to what I want to do and what I did for my thesis is how can we make this practical? How can we actually use it? And so you'll see it's a very practical bent of, of what the research I did. And so um, the first slide here is just because I'm focusing on wicked problems and I'm sure everyone probably is quite familiar with wicked problems, but um, I find that in the United States, um, in our government, that facing wicked problems is, is just, we, we have no clue. Um, we have all these agencies, but nobody can really understand the problems, right? And so we ended up, we do a lot of solving of problems that we don't understand. And so I really wanted to kind of put this up here and to really kind of say, this is the wicked problem is what I'm trying to organize around or have a response to. And, um, and of course, most wicked problems fall in public domain, maybe on a local level, community level but national levels, state levels, and also, you know, international levels, which is especially challenging. Um, and then there's this concept of super wicked problems, which it really started coming up in, you know, 2009 around in there when we really started grappling with, with how are we going to internationally address climate change? And so climate change is the classic super wicked problem. Um, but we have others, many of them actually are related to climate change, but you know, human migrations, um, water, uh, water uh, security, food security. I mean, these things are really super wicked problems and, um, but no less needing of, of being addressed. So what I tried to get across to the agencies that I work with is, is that, you know, there is a wicked problem there and it's got all these interdependencies and it has, and it changes and it morphs. And we were looking down these cylinders of excellence. And so what we ended up doing is we play whack-a-mole, right? So we look down these cylinders at the thing, so we hit a whack-a-mole and another one pops up over here. And then we, we do an intervention over here and then another one pops up over here. And so we're not thinking in terms of second, third order effects. We're not thinking, we're just in our agencies, we're just got our blinders on. Um, those blinders are, are incredibly in, you know, instantiated by budgets, um, missions, um, you know, feelings of pride of your area, um, 
you know, you may be thinking that you have a better handle on the problem than somebody else who maybe is looking at it a different part of the problem. So these are things that I've run across many, many times in my career when trying to do inner, um, you know, interdisciplinary and agency kinds of um, solutions, decision support. So in the research, you know, there is a lot about why is it so hard? Um, and, you know, we in the United States um, have started, we have czars. And if you actually Google the number of czars that we have, we have a czar for almost everything. And they're basically either appointed because they're experts in some area, but then again, if we're talking about wicked problems, how expert can one person be? Or they're political kind of associates that, you know, well, maybe they're good organizers. So they'll make a mazar for, you know, um, public health or something. The other thing we do a lot of is task forces. So we have the concept that we have to have multi-agency members um, in a group that are going after some of these bigger problems. Um, typically though, here we have one agency kind of lead that task force. And so there's a lot of mistrust that comes on in task forces because some agency is actually leading it. And so if you're not in that agency and you're a multi-agency person, sometimes there's a little issue of trust. And so the things you hear all the time, and I'm sure you guys have all heard these things, right? It's like to try to coordinate and to collaborate. It's like too many meetings and you have overlapping goals and you know, synchronization is really hard. Um, sharing information is really, you know, difficult, you know, and a lot of it is the not invented here, you know, and so these are things that I have just, you know, grappled with for a long, long time trying to, to do decision support for complex problems. And so, of course, government needs systems thinking, and, and this is just to say, thinking about managing a problem and switching from this concept of solving um, because with wicked problems, we never really can feel like we can put a, a ribbon around it, tie it off, and then say, here, you know, we're done. And it's not really about control, really. So influencing things. Uh, it's hard to control with the problems. It's about anticipation and not prediction. I mean, we have to give up on, on wicked problems being able to, you know, in my opinion, um, just run, uh, you know, big data algorithms and, and have it spit out what's, what's going to happen. And then really focuses on learning and adaption versus the one and done kind of idea. So, um, so for my research, I decided um, to do kind of a two pronged um, phase um, approach. Uh, the first phase I'm going to talk about just briefly, um, but it was to generate a multi perspective, common, not consensus, uh, interagency understanding of a specific wicked problem and then to tailor an agile and interagency response to manage it. And so the idea there is, is that, you know, for a wicked problem, if we're gonna organize around it, we need to see the wicked problem kind of as, as the main focus, right? So it is the environment um, in which we're going to try to organize in the concept of the VSM. Um, and so it's, it's really looking at practical concerns again, and it's to advance also the knowledge of systemic intervention in practice. So I have a kind of a case study. Um, it specifically looks at the drug trade, illicit drug trade, and all the agencies in the United States that are involved in responding to it. It's a classic wicked problem. The different agencies that respond to it all have their different pieces of it. Um, and of course, I'm not actually creating a real interagency. I don't have that kind of clout. Um, but I was able to, through all my, my uh, national sec security experience, I have a lot of connections. And I was able to get into many of the agencies and get some fairly high level stakeholders to participate. Um, and so there is a paper I've, I've written on this first part that is published. Um, it's uh, in uh, EJORS. And then the second paper, which is on the VSM, we're just now um, doing a revision on it and ho hopefully it will get fun, uh, uh, published too. So the first step was I really felt that some of the major problems, and Jonathan, we talked about a little bit of this, is that 
we don't have the same understanding of the problem. So not only can we not figure out how to organize efficiently, but we're just seeing the problem differently and we don't even recognize that within our agencies. And so I wanted to do something really simple um, and I wanted to do something where I went to them and I went to each of the agencies and I sat down with one or two stakeholders and I asked them from their perspective and only their perspective and let them be free with whatever they wanted to put on, on the table is to take sticky notes and index cards and write what are the elements of the problem as you see it. And then after we lay those all on the table, we draw lines between them to say, well, where are the interdependencies? And then to do some boundary critique because I need to kind of get them used to the feeling that we're gonna to have to put boundaries on this because otherwise it's gonna grow and it's gonna be way too big. Weight them for me. So tell me what elements of the problem are like for you the most important or if you could intervene, which elements would you hit first? And so we ended up with these, these tables that I took photographs of. Um, and then I actually took those photographs and put them in something called Cytoscape. It's a software package, it's free and open source. Actually, I think developed for um, the biomedical um, and biology um, folks. Works really well to do system mapping. So it was kind of nice to be able to do something open source. And then I took each of those individual ones. So everyone was able to do kind of problem structuring without any other agency in the room. And I did that specifically because if I would have brought them all together in the very beginning and didn't do it individually, all those things that you know will happen is, you know, power relationships and, and not invented here and, not really listening to the other person because you're so busy kind of focusing on what, what you're going to say. That's all gone because I did it individually first. And then I just put them in Cytoscape and then I merged them all. And what ended up being kind of, you know, it was a messy map. There was a lot of um, inconsistencies. There were a lot of terminology issues. Um, and that was fine because once I had that, I could then bring them together. So the boundary critique was really about bringing them together with this already merged map. And so we, oh, I guess I missed a slide here. But so what I ended up doing is there was a workshop, actually two workshops that we took that map and then together all the agencies sat down and we talked about elements, we talked about weights and we had to make a lot of decisions. And so there were, arguments, respectful arguments, because once they've gotten in the room, they've already put down what they believe. So it's not like they can backtrack or, or can, they can say, oh, well, yeah, whatever you say. It's like, this is what they thought. And so people can say, well, why did you think that was a five? So here's an example. Um, one of the stakeholders was a Chicago policeman um, who was mostly really focused on what was happening on the streets with the drug trade and gangs. And then another person was actually from the military, SOCOM. And they were responsible for looking more international and looking for um, places like, um, you know, where, where drug um, uh, trafficking was happening, maybe in South America or even from China. And so they were a lot broader. And then we had border patrol. And they, of course, were just focused on the border. Well, once we got to talking about stash houses, so um, so the guy, the, the, the Chicago cop said, the stash houses on the border are the most important thing. That's a five. Because when I get, if you could get the, to those and destroy them, I wouldn't have a problem. It would never get to my city. And then of course the SOCOM guys are going, really? Because I mean, we're all focused on stopping the source, right? And so there was a lot of conversation about just scale. You know, the, the different agencies see things at different scales. And so understanding really that those stash houses, how important they were, we didn't, in that case, we actually came up with compromise and, and gave it kind of a middle weight. In other cases where that happened, we would, one person would say, you know what, you're right. That is a five. I didn't see it from your perspective before. And now that I see where you're coming from, I can see why in the whole realm of things that actually is pretty important. 
So we did this through, through two different workshops through that whole map to come up with what we called the common understanding. And um, again, there were some still differences, but pretty much there was a lot of aha moments. There was just a lot of agency, agency saying, I never even looked at it that way. Or I didn't even know that was an aspect of the problem because we never even deal with that, right? So, so that was a really important step because you really can't organize around a wicked problem until you've had the hard discussions about well, what is the problem in the first place. And so the problem structuring and boundary critique phase of it, I think really important. So then I took that map and then now what, right? So a lot of folks will actually go to the point where, okay, we've got ourselves, you know, a common understanding of the problem. But then what, <laughs> right? I mean, that's just not enough. I and mean, we have to say, well, now how are we going to work together to actually try to address it? And so this is where the viable system model comes in. And I like these two quotes. Um, I mean, just in order to design and maintain, okay? So this is something when you organize an interagency, it's not a one and done. They're going to have to keep after this problem because the problem keeps changing and morphing. And every time they do an intervention, it's, it changes the problem. So, so it's not something that, it has to be something you can maintain. And it's gotta be able to tackle the complexity of the problem. The organization must be closely attuned to the environment. So this is where I'm taking that, that wicked problem that we've just got done structuring. And now we wanna marry it with an organization that can, and I like what, Chris, uh, what uh, Angela says a lot, is, is dance. They have to be able to, the interagency has to be able to adapt and dance um, with the wicked problem. And so it's a co-evolutionary relationship. And I, and I really like, and I wanna emphasize that's where the learning comes in. It's gotta be a learning interagency that's constantly looking at the environment and trying to adapt to it. And, and I think that's, that's, you know, you guys all know the viable system model, but for me, when I, when I really started understanding how the viable system model can do that, I thought, well, that's exactly what we need. Um, so, so looking at requisite variety, of course, Ross Ashby says only variety can destroy variety. And I say only variety can manage variety. Because again, I just, I think we have to kind of get folks away from solutions you know, that, that it's done. I mean, there's this linear feeling that you do step one, two, three, four, and then you're done. And governments don't like anything that has that any concept of going on and on, right? Governments wanna, you know, fund something, fix the problem and then go on to the next problem. And what we have to, with wicked problems, we have to understand that we have to set up management of them. We have to constantly adjust to them. And we can't just think we're gonna just spend all this money and this is what, I've done all my life, spend all this money and time, and then, then just feel like, okay, now we're moving on. So the organization has to be able to generate sufficient variety to respond and match the variety of the wicked problem. So again, we, we don't get a total solution. And here the important to me when I started looking at the VSM, what I, what I really liked, um, I like the self-organization part of it. Because interagencies are really, the agencies themselves are really not happy with um, control. They don't want somebody else to come in and take their time away from there. They want to have this be something that they kind of self-organize. They also, the homeostasis idea, right? Again, getting back to the fact that it isn't just like, okay, we're done. We're constantly have to be in balance. We have to, to adjust to changes and not hierarchical. Um, in fact, a lot of times we do turn the VSM on its side to just kind of get them away from thinking that there's some hierarchy, that somehow there's a five out there that's going to come and just tell them what to do and, and it takes their autonomy away from them. So flipping it on the side and looking at the wicked problem the wicked problem is going to have local environments that each of these different agencies are going to be working in. But now we want to see those, those local environments fused together as a whole. And of course, that's where four comes in. And we're going to get into a little bit more about how that three, four homeostasis is just so important. Um, 
and so, so not done well in many cases. So the VSM workshop, we organized the agencies to come um, and, and we basically put the wicked problem on the board. And then I created a, a, a board game. So we put the wicked problem on the wall and then we sat them at a table with a board game in front of them. And then we walk through the steps. We started with what was system five, because I felt like the first thing we needed to do is we get it, it needed them to pry off their agency hats, which is really hard, and put on a hat that they're now part of a different team. So they still have their agency hat, they go and do their agency thing, but when they're part of the inner agency, they have to have an identity. And so I asked them, well, what would you call the interagency and what would be the purpose and what might be the set of values for it? So they basically talked about that. We put bullets together. And at the break, I went ahead and kind of tried to put it into a mission statement. And you can take a minute if you want just to read what they said their mission statement was. So during this whole thing, I'm just a facilitator. And so everything I, I really pushed on them, they are the ones that are creating their own inner agency. Nobody's coming in and saying, here's what you ought to do. They have to do it from scratch. And so once they had their system five, I said, okay, look at this thing on the wall. <laughs> Where are you doing any attenuation or amplification on the wicked problem. And of course, all these agencies are constantly working on it. Either they're collecting um, intel on it or they're um, doing interventions. They may be doing raids. They may be doing, um, maybe working um, with uh, corrupt officials trying to do things more at the national level. I mean, there's all sorts of things that these people do every day and they're very good at what they do and they're very passionate. I mean. They, they all believe that they're doing really good things. But you can see they're all doing them on parts of the wicked problem without really having a really good idea of where else somebody is working or how those are inter, um, interrelated. So we asked them to go up to the board. So this is the first part of the board game and actually use a color-coded um, um, way of circling parts of the problem they're involved in and then put sticky notes on anything you're doing to attenuate or to amplify on the problem. Just sticky notes. And um, when we actually got done with that process, they all went back to their tables and brought their sticky notes with them. And so for each sticky note, I gave them a chip, poker chip, and said, okay, you're gonna have a stack of poker chips here that are gonna represent in anything you're doing, either you're, you're doing attenuation or you're, you're um, trying to amplify your presence into the wicked problem. And once they had all these chips, we then sat down to the board game, which is basically the viable system model diagram. So each of those circles that you see there, those are um, each of the system ones, which are each of the agencies. And we have, you know, of course, the channels of information, and we have the environment, which is on the wall in front of them. And so we started um, looking at basically just channels of information flow, right? Because of course, within our agencies, this is the first big problem. And so we asked them to take for each of the chips they had that corresponded to their, their um, sticky notes, which things can you freely share? And if they could freely share they would put it into the channels. So those chips would go in the channels and they go up to system three. Then I said, well, what are those things that you have there that you say you can't freely share? What are the reasons why you can't share them? And so we really talked a lot about, well, clearance levels. Somebody might not have the right clearance level for that. Um, databases, right? Incompatibility of databases. How can I get somebody to log in on my database so they can share that information? Those are things that are, that can be overcome, but they have to be system two. So these are things that we put in system two. What things can we do to kind of help manage the collaboration and the coordination amongst, you know, can we 
you know, what if, if we made a list of them, so the recommendations, recommendations are that we make sure that Chicago police officers, at least a couple of them, can get clearance levels to be able to share with other uh, folks what intel is going on about the problem. Or maybe we're going to look at how um, the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security can, can get shared databases where they can actually, you know, log in on each other's databases. I mean, there are a number of things that they came up with. Um, and then there are a certain number of things that they just can't ever share or don't feel like they can share. And most of those things were, had personal information. So any agency that actually had personal information said, well, no, we can't share that. But what could we do to aggregate to a level where you took away some of that personal information? So maybe that is doable. So what became, you know, at, at the beginning was, oh, well, we can only share these few things, became much more a conversation about how can we overcome those things? And a lot, a lot of like, oh, yeah, I guess that wouldn't be so hard. And of course, it would take funding, but at least it's a, a level of conversation that says, well, here's some things that we could promote to say this would be great if we could fund these things because it would really help. Um, so that was that step. Um, so the systems twos, you know, basically that's what we came up with. What are the current mechanisms for joint activities and what conflicts arise and how can we resolve those? And um, I mean, I can just say from being in workshops that this was something new. <laughs> I mean, you know, they've been in task forces, they've been in meetings. A lot of times they're being thrown into meetings and, and they're like, okay, talk about this problem. They never get to this level, right? And so this was something I think for a lot of them was new and it started creating a lot more trust amongst them. Um, system three, that was, you know, we, we moved a lot of information to system three and this is a sticky point, right? Because this is the management of an interagency. And they just like, how is that gonna work? Because as I said, task forces would put one agency kind of as system three over everyone. And they were not, too interested in that. Um, so what they, and so we said, well, what things would you, you know, be okay with? Um, and so they started thinking in terms of maybe we have um, like a committee or a council that has to be at least three years, they're on the council, but they have to go back to parent agencies. But the, the council acts as a system three. And, and that it comes up with a set of rules. They're rules that they agree upon in order to be part of any agencies. This is how we play nice. Um, and then we really talked about some of those rules and some of them were hard. It's like, you know, um, the big thing with these agencies is somebody comes in after they've spent all this time on Intel and they're about to go in and do something, another agency comes in and ruins it. <laughs> and that happens too often. So they're like, we can't have that, right? So there's all these things that they had to come up with that were um, rules of engagement. So here's some suggestions. Um, expand fusion centers, um, and they should have analysts in them. They don't. Um, fusion centers really just have data people or GIS people. Um, they need to have analysts. Um, DEA, Special Operations Division, um, leverage off that because that's already kind of an interagency, even though that would be one agency kind of leading it, but maybe we could take that build on it. Um, so these were all things that kind of already existed and how can we leverage what we've existed, but change them to fit into what a system three should look like. And um, so rules of joint recognition, big thing was, is like, if we make, if we, if I'm getting, um, uh, you know, my recognition in my agency, well, if I'm doing something joint, do I get the same recognition, right? If I'm working with three other agencies, how do I get my recognition for being part of that? So that was a big part of it. Um, metrics, um, don't piggyback on sources. Um, past technical information, not just, you know, information about, you know, gee, I know kind of what's going on, but tactical, what am I doing right now? So that we can kind of understand that, well, I probably wait three weeks before I do this, because you're gonna be doing this first. Um, and then um, the S3 doesn't have it to reach down. So again, it's not like the S3 is like, you know, all knowing. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's a committee and if it needs to, it can go into system ones and get information as it's needed. Um, and Intel gap analysis. Now system four. This is an interesting one to me because again, 
I can't tell you how many really sophisticated integrated systems, uh, simulation modeling systems I've put together to do prediction on wicked problems. Well, one model doesn't work. So then we integrate two models and then we integrate three models because they're all interdependent, right? So we ended up having models that were, you know, look at, you know, climate change impact on, on national security. So you have, you know, one that's this climate change model and then how does it impact water and how does it impact human migration? So I worked on a project that actually had all these national laboratories with all these individual models that we were just gonna kind of glue together so that we can handle all these interdependencies and be able to get ahead of, get ahead of the problem. Well, you can imagine that didn't work. Um, and so anticipation is really important and adaptation. And if you don't have three and four working together, I, you just cannot have that. And so it's like, it seems almost as a nuance of the VSM, but even Stafford says over and over again, this is the problem area. This, this hardly ever works in organizations. And it certainly doesn't work in governments and in interagency. Um, and so if we could just get to working that we had some semblance of this. And so when we looked at this particular um, issue, we looked at what are existing kinds of systems that we could maybe, you know, kind of adapt from and leverage from. Again, we don't want to absolutely, you know, throw away all the, the bath water with the baby, but we kind of want to look at what can we leverage from? And so S4 existing, but what could we have that we recommend that we needed for S4? So how do criminal relationships evolve? Um, anticipation of telecommunication advances. So these were things that they came up with like, well, if we had this, this would be great. We don't have that yet. So system four was about like, what can we do to better do anticipation? And then what we thought would be if we had, and this is something we weren't able to do, but the concept was, is if we had system four, who was also owner of the system map, and every time something changes, like if they're doing major operations, updates the system map so that this is the current state, and then started doing scenario analysis, or maybe they're going to use, um, you know, idealized design. Or, I mean, whatever you're going to use for your forecasting and your foresight, you would be doing that off of, of an updated where you're at right now with the problem. And um, that particular idea, I think, would be really useful. It would be expensive, but probably not more expensive than individual agencies doing their individual modeling and simulation and not really having much to say for it. And so when we put it all together, um, we look at the wicked problem and we have to remember that we're part of it. So I put it so it surrounds you, right? So the wicked problem, if you're an agency that's constantly doing things on the wicked problem, you're a part of that environment. So you're not separated from it. So I wanted to really kind of emphasize that. Um, and then we actually put the organization in a, a, you know, we'll look at well, where are you doing attenuation and amplification on the problem? So that's where we kind of did our local environments. And of course, attenuation and amplification, they have all sorts of things they're doing, con ops, training, joint operations, situational awareness, intelligence, drones, um, you know, remote sensing of, of, co of cocaine crops. I mean, there's all sorts of things they're doing. Um, and then there's external things that aren't even, you know, anticipated. So, you know, external disturbance, economic shocks or shifts in gain power or political upheaval. Those things can happen too that will affect this wicked problem in, in, overnight. Um, so they need to be aware of those. Um, and so we basically have this inner agencies working independently because that's the way they're funded and that's the way their missions are. But now they're more aware of the whole and they're doing an anticipation of the future. So this is where anticipating the future, they do more of that, as much of that in system one as they do actually just figuring out what's going on today. So how do you actually leverage from things they're already doing and moving into some system four, which actually could either collate individual agencies um, anticipation stuff 
Or so let's say somebody's doing a modeling and simulation and they're anticipating that there's going to be a shift from heroin to cocaine trafficking. Where does that information or that anticipation go? It might be within one agency, but it has to get put up into the force so it can share with the whole um, inner agency. So it's not just a matter, and this is something that was just kind of a switch to their thinking, because they were thinking all along, it's about information we're collecting. How do I get information I'm collecting on the problem to other people? But it's about how you're anticipating the problem too. So if you're doing a lot and you, you really have some sophisticated modeling or you're using data analysis or whatever you're using to say we're anticipating this to happen, that anticipation has to be shared just as much as current information. Communication, we talked a lot about that and, and how that could be better. And then monitoring the resource bargain. That's the rules of engagement that the system three has put forth. And so it has to be like if, a, if an agency is not doing what the rule of engagement is, it's piggybacking on sources, then system three has to go back and say, you're not following the rules and we need you to do that. And again, this is a sticky one because they don't have authority. They can't tell the agency what to do because of course the agency, the agency's answer to, to the executive branch. There is, I mean, the, the, the viable system above, recursive above, is really the federal government. There isn't, you know, somebody else. And so each of these agencies really are autonomous and they can do what they want. So these resource bargains have to be kind of something that they agree to and that they are monitored. And so coordinated activities. So that's kind of putting it all together. Let me move on. to summaries and conclusions. Um, so I did a, um, um, a set of questionnaires with the agencies about both phases of the research and then kind of a one that covered like how it all worked together. Um, the concerns that they have is getting the stakeholders into the process. So I didn't have every stakeholder agency that should be there. So when we played the game, there were circles that were left on the table that didn't have anyone at them. But we had to recognize that those agencies are playing a part, but I could not get an agency stakeholder for like say state department. I didn't get an agency uh, stakeholder um, for treasury. So, so there were stakeholders missing and we put them around the table. So we just knew they were there, but it was difficult to get them all to engage. And it would work well with top agency directors. Could we get the directors to actually buy off? So the people that were uh, stakeholders were pretty much middle to late career um, experts from agencies, but it wasn't the directors. Um, but I was invited. So two of the major agencies were um, the uh, Border Patrol and DEA. So those are two big, big players. I was able to go talk to the directors of both those agencies. I was invited in to give a talk with the stakeholders in the room because they were so excited about this. They just thought this was one of the best things they've ever seen. And for each of them, they were like, how do I take the VSM and apply it a recursive level below? Because they were sitting there going, gosh, I can see what the problem is. I'm a system three. In the system four, right? You know, I'm the same person. Um, and so they started kind of seeing themselves and seeing the viable system model within their agencies. Um, and they suggested that we didn't throw away existing constructs. And that is how we looked at, well, how can we leverage or change what we already have to work better? And they, they thought the physical and intimate reaction, interaction, getting not only with the viable system model, board game, but when we did the problem structuring, really physical. You get in there and you move things around and, and you talk about things and you, you, you say, well, let's take this element out because you know everyone gave it a one for a, a weight. So let's take it out for now. So they, they actually physically move things around. And I think that helps understand things a lot better. Um, and I think that they explicitly uh, identified overlaps. They thought that was awesome to actually be on the board with the map and showing where they have overlaps or where there are gaps between what agency's taking care of this part, right? Because nobody's there. Um, and then they can design the blue net themselves, right? So this wasn't somebody coming in and telling them what to do. 
And the adaption achieved through this three, S3, S4, there was a lot of talk about that. I, mean, I think I could have done a whole nother PhD, really just on exploring what could be happening in that area. Um, and then um, began to see their own agencies as recursive. Like I said, they actually started seeing how they could apply things even further down. Um, so here's just some feedback. I can let you read some of the feedback that we, that were in the the uh, questionnaires that I got. So that's pretty much it. Well, thank you very much, Pam. This is really, really interesting and exciting. And um, I'm pretty sure seeing the comments from everyone that uh, lots of people are wanting to, to share with you. So let's start the conversation. Um, I have, well, I know that Brian is, is, is asking uh, a question, but we have already some people in the queue. So, first of all, Stefan, Stefan is asking if you are happy to share your PowerPoint with the audience. Would you be happy sure. to share it, Pam? Yes. Yep. I'll send it to you, Angela, and then you can. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will share it with with people. Um, may May have a couple of questions. May, would you like to do your questions? Angela. Uh, thank you so much, Pamela. That was really so elaborate and so interesting. And um, I'm not very familiar with the VSM, so apologies for my perhaps naive mm -hmm. questions. But I would like to understand whether the chips were symbolizing something, for example, rewards or incentives, and how it might be used in another uh, situation, for example, you know, symbolically. Um, yeah. And my other question is with regards to, I mean, I, do, I think I get the VSM with regards to structuring a, a wicked problem and understanding, facilitating the understanding of the multiple agencies in um, getting the different aspects of a complex problem, right? I understand that. And I think it's really elaborate and very clear and has a great structure. But uh, from an academic point of view, I, I don't understand what is analysis. Where exactly is the analysis? So what will constitute the analysis in an academic paper, for example? Okay. <laughs> so the first question, um, examples of what those chips would reckon. So when they went up to their the map and they put their little sticky notes and designated their local environment within the problem, they sat down and said, okay, um, let's say it's an agency. I collect crop information on cocaine. And so that was a sticky note, they get a chip for that. Um, another person might say, I'm, um, I'm actively um, working to disassemble um, uh, chemistry labs in uh, Mexico because a lot of times um, raw, raw materials would come into Mexico and Mexico would be where they process if we could get there. So I'm, I'm looking at how to get to that. So that's a chip. So, Basically, they just represent things that we're already doing. It could be information they collected, but it could be like things that we're actively doing. Just awareness that somebody, another agency might be like, I had no idea that you were doing that work with the labs, right? And in most cases they didn't, right? Or one agency would know, but the rest of the agencies didn't know. So that's what those represent. They represent what each of those different agencies are actively doing on the wicked problem. So once they had those, then we could talk about like, well, can you share that? And why can't you share that? And what kind of things could we do to enable you to share that so that everyone had that awareness? Um, on the academic side and analysis, I mean, this is something I've had to kind of change my mind on, right? Because most of my career at a national laboratory was very analytical, uh, very mathematical. Um, and this isn't the same kind of analysis. This is, this is softer. Um, it's not that you couldn't have, and, and so in the system four, there's a lot of room for, um, in fact, for the research that I did, 
I did this while I was still at the National Laboratory. And the overall research project had a second component, which actually was to use um, system dynamic modeling um, for the supply chains within the drug trafficking. So we could try to say, okay, can we predict what's going to be the impact on supply chains? So there's any number of things that system force can have. The, the biggest problem in the idea is, is it has to be shared system for. It can't be that individual agencies are doing their predictions, but they're not sharing predictions either. So, so it's analysis in the sense that there are pockets of where analysis goes, but the VSM in itself is much more of a design. It's, it's much more of a, I mean, I did this actually the same exact um, um, process I did with an NSF project that I finished last year. And that was to organize a response to a wicked problem within a, uh, a Chicago neighborhood, which was they were having real trouble with STEM education and having successful STEM education. So we did the exact process. We talked to all the stakeholder groups, there were 23 of them, and we we got that problem structured. And then we, what we ended up doing for the VSM was really kind of um, a, uh, a, blue, a blueprint or a plan that, that how we could improve communications, how could they do it? So in that size, the VSM was actually, you know, kind of a strategic plan. So, you know, it depends on the problem and it depends on the funding, right? And it depends on the willingness to actually make change. And so this is my biggest frustration, right? Is when it really comes down to actually the decision makers to say, yes, now we have a holistic idea about this wicked problem. Now we have some real ideas about systemic interventions, but how do you get the different agencies to basically, you know, sign up and stick with it? And, and so of course that's still going to be a problem. And, and I just think that the more awareness that these projects or these kinds of things can do to clearly show how they do not understand the problem unless they look at it together. They only know parts of it. And that's one thing I think that, that it may seem like a nuance or a simple thing, but at least in my research, that is an aha moment that people really say, I had no idea of the breadth of the problem. So, um, so analysis wise, I mean, yeah, I mean, I couldn't publish this work to be honest with you probably in a US operations journal. Um, it just doesn't have enough math and doesn't have enough analytics. Um, thank you, Pam. Before we continue with the questions, would you, would you mind stopping to share the screen so that we can all see you? Oh, yeah. Bigger, bigger. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Am I there? I'm there. I'm back. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have um, Ellen. Ellen have a question? Is Ellen there? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if Ellen is there, but if it's not there, I'll call her back in. Um, so we have Jens. Jens. Uh, I don't have any questions. I, I enjoy it very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> right. Uh, Brian. Uh, Brian, are you ready for your question? Are you there? Doesn't seem to be that Brian is there, so we'll come back to you. Jonathan? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, so really, really interesting. Um, I liked it a lot. Um, uh, so the comments I'm going to make are just, I hope, uh, are helpful. Um, I didn't... So... It appeared to me at first that we're using the VSM as a means of analysis, of understanding um, the wicked problem. And there's another part to that, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is creating a viable system that deals with that wicked problem. And that viable system is much more dynamic. And one of the problems I have discovered is top-down design, set creating a strategy doesn't work very well. You need bottom up meets top down. You, you have to start doing stuff in the real environment 
and then map how it's changing compared to what you want. But going back to the analysis, um, I really like the influence diagram because that's exactly the path I go down. Um, what I didn't get my head around, which I think is really important, was how you had mapped out the state space of the environment. So coming back to the law of requisite variety, what's really important is that the amount, the state of the environment, the, the, the states in the environment can be um, attenuated by the behaviors of the system. So that is two Venn diagrams, one fits on top of the other. And then you take, for me, then you take the influence diagram to see how your behaviors deal with that in the environment. So for instance, I might only need one coat to deal with autumn, winter and spring. Um, I've got one behavior that deals with three things. So for me, mapping the state space always needs to come first so you understand the environment. The influence diagram I thought was really interesting, but the key thing I found with influence diagrams that I found really, really important in change management is that the nodes indicate systems that have the most behaviors and they control the system. So if you're looking at how to influence the system, rather than try to change the whole state space, what you're looking at is managing those nodes. Now, I got a feeling looking at your diagram that the, the nodes were the people, when you talk to a person, you'd almost created a node per person. Am I wrong with that? Well, in the very beginning, um, it, it, no, the nodes, so the nodes were definitely, definitely a lot of them were systems, right? So a node would be um, banks, right? So what role do banks play in the laundering of right. drug money? Um, so your, then, your diagram, your influence diagram had some really nice nodes on it, which would indicate um, areas that you need to influence or so on, which I, I'm not sure if you didn't sort of mention that you sort of picked up on that. Yeah. Um, the, I might just the, make, because you brought something up that I, I failed to mention is that when we were all done, we asked them to actually come up with a top seven systemic interventions now that they understood it as a whole and that they were acting as an interagency and not individual, right? So they came up with seven and I, I did fail to put that in there um, where they did what we called, um, I called it, um, it called an influencing tra influence tracing or intervention tracing, where I said, if you're going to make this intervention, which nodes are you touching? Right. And then look at the connections to those nodes that you're planning on touching. And we can't predict that if you change this node, how it's going to affect everything, but we should be aware of that other things could be affected if we make that change and we don't make the problem worse or we will lose an opportunity that if we're gonna change this node, we should have thought about changing something over here too. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So just to, to put that in there, because I did forget to mention that what we call so, intervention tra tracing. So I thought it was a really good way of teasing out the viability of the system. That the only other problem I have with top-down design is what people think they do isn't necessarily what they do. When I tracked what organizations said they do and where their priorities were it turned out they didn't often especially in government have the control to to create a strategy within their own department they were providing so i had this a long debate with people about you know what is the police force is it an autonomous system or is it part of system two as a society and i discovered i decided that the military was so inefficient that i, I worked in the military and i decided the military was so inefficient and so impossible that it couldn't be a viable system. And it suddenly dawned on me that it was actually um, system two. It was a function of society. And if you even, it could afford to be inefficient because it just gets recreated again. Um, and one of the problems you might have is in dealing with organizations like that, that they are functions of society. And for them, to, they're being driven by other forces. I, I don't know if you found that. Oh yeah, like one of the things that it, that you know, when we look at the environment around an interagency, I chose to make the wicked problem that environment so we could focus on it. But there's a whole realm of other influences and environment around them, right? There is, you know, again, administration changes. I mean, just when you get an interagency kind of working or an agency kind of figuring something out, 
we have an administration change and they change the directors and all of a sudden, you know, they're not working on that anymore. So, I mean, there's so many more other things in the environment than the wicked problem. But for my research, I thought, let's just at least focus on if we were to say, and so the one thing I like about this is, is that it doesn't have to, you can use it for different wicked problems and different system ones. So I used it in Chicago. With but from a viability sense of view, what I'm trying to say is mm -hmm. I, I couldn't see very clearly, but it looked as though there's only one level of recursion. And so yeah. those other levels of recursion become very important in how you're creating that viability. Right. That's all. And, yeah, no, that's really, really good. And that's why I was really excited about some of them wanting to look at the, at the, the recursion below individually with agents. The recursion above is, is is really hard because these agencies all just report to Congress and to um, in the United States to Congress and to the executive branch. So, you know, how do you get there? That's and that's part of mapping the state space and the behaviors. Is those are the behaviors that you have their reality you have to deal with. I I think yeah. yeah definitely. That's that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, several people queuing, so I'll go in order, in the order of the queues. We have um, um, Alfredo. Alfredo. Okay. Thank you, Angela. Um, Pam, very interesting your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I want to focus uh, from one specific perspective, which is I, I like very much uh, your introduction. This is uh, not a solution. You cannot find a solution for something like this. You can manage. You can expect to manage. It. And I fully agree with that from your starting point. Now, uh, regarding the application of the VSM, I think the VSM is practical. Once you know which are your system ones. Then in order to build up <clears throat> your management structure, then you can apply <clears throat> a VSM. But I think, and from my experience, uh, I have been working with uh, wicked problems. I call them high complexity problems to, to leave out the ethical or moral uh, thing with wicked. Yeah. Messy situations, I think, is in that word. I, I call them high complexity, yeah, yeah. Uh, because they involve many actors, many, 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 many issues, yeah, many disciplines that are relevant, yeah, many cultures. It's a big mess, as Akov used to call them, yeah, <clears throat> very, very big mess. The, the main problem, <clears throat> uh, from my perspective, is how to find your systems one, and I think the uh, <clears throat> the problem. <clears throat> I'm sorry, is that the graph and influence diagrams and all that is unfortunately not able to do that. Yeah. Uh, I have seen, <clears throat> uh, uh, there's one uh, very interesting, interesting TAD uh, talk yeah, about wicked problems. Somebody showed a 50 square meter panel full of arrows, lines, and all that. Yeah. So you can analyze that kind of problems forever, yeah? And deep and deep and deep, but that does not give you really a, an actual, a practicable map. And that's my, my, the point on which I wanted to, to comment. The problem of, map, of mapping, yeah? Um, <clears throat> what is the, the, the way of mapping? Come to uh, Ashby's law, yeah? The problem is, or the, the challenge here is how to map that thing that can is uh, huge, 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 as many times as you want to say that, 50 square meter diagram, yeah? How to make it practically? Uh, well, what I have developed and worked over many, many years is a principle based- oh, Excuse me, say that again. Is a principle. Okay. which I call the complexity participation principle, yeah? In which the complexity is through, what does, it, what does this mean, yeah? The <clears throat> main, I think the best way to build up 
variety yeah, we have available is human minds and interacting human minds. Yeah, that's much better than any computer you can possibly imagine. Yeah, just count the number of neurons we have and, and their connections and all that and language. So human minds and natural language are our fantastic variety processors. We do have, we have them built in, in our, in our uh, nature. <clears throat> yeah. Well, what we do in uh, the tools I have developed is precisely that, put that uh, huge uh, force to work yeah, in order to map a high complexity program. And we have succeeded. Yeah. We have, we map these kind of problems in one page. Yeah, and that makes, that has two very important uh, characteristics. That makes the problem understandable. Yeah. And normally we have found that this kind of wicked problems have, or high complexity, between seven and 15 dimensions. Yeah, we can find the dimensions. Yeah, and the dimensions do not come out as a, result of analysis, but as a result of interaction of minds in language, okay? This is the way this, we, we produce that. And we uh, normally, uh, in, in not, not virtually, but presentially, our workshops in one day workshop with the appropriate people there, up to 25 people, we build, yeah? The tool we, we have is called the action map. Yeah, and the action map is a tool on language. It's a language that is able to do that job. Yeah. So, so I, might, I want to just kind of mention something here in, in lieu of this is that the two phases, of course, the VSM did not do anything um, to map the problem. The problem was done I, with I, soft I, systems. I got that. I got that. I got that. In the soft systems realm of why we mapped the problem to the detail we did. Um, we did boundary critique throughout the whole thing. So in the beginning, there was boundary critique even just to select the agencies. And we did a workshop with, um, at the National Defense University with experts in the field to say, well, what are system ones? I, mean, I, I kind of had an idea, but I wasn't, I don't know the problem that well. So we got experts in, so we did some boundary critique. Then as we got some of those agencies together, they themselves said, oh, you're missing one. You should have so-and-so at the table. So we were able to add some to, to that too. Um, but what I look at it as, as is not, we didn't analyze the problem so much as we learned. So the process of doing the mapping from the individual agencies and then bringing them together was so much more of a learning process as it was to come up with something and even the computerized map was only just because that was easier for me to melt to merge them. But we didn't do any analytics on it. We didn't. We don't have any mathematics going on on the nodes. It was a learning thing, so that they could start learning. And so the boundary critique was, well, what's more important to the whole? So we we had to make decisions about putting things outside, right? Which ones were low? And so what I did with the map in a lot of cases is I grayed out many of those nodes and interdependencies which were of low importance, just to show that they're there, but they're grayed out. And then we focused in the bolder colors on the ones that everyone weighted as higher. So I think that I, I get what you're saying for sure is this, that's really difficult. And I have a lot of people tell me when they see these maps, like, well, they're, they're just too busy. And I'm like, well, the point wasn't the final map. The point was the learning that went all the way through and the discussions and the arguments that, that happen. I mean, you have to argue about it respectfully, but there will be arguments because people will feel very strongly about things, um, about the wicked problem. So the learning process was so much more important, I think, then. And when we got to the VSM, even then it was more about learning about what different local environments people had and what were their, so there, it's all about their worldviews. These aren't these aren't things that, that were like, okay, this is data analytics and, and I have data to put in the nodes. It's just somebody's worldview about what's part of the problem. So it's a lot less analytic than um, 
than one might think just because you see the computer maps. It's just, that was just a way to represent. I really didn't do anything beyond that. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. I, I will uh, share a, the, an action map. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like in, case, in, in case anyone wants to, I, I don't have too many in English, but I, but uh, but I have, and so I, I I'll ask Angela how to how to do that. Angela knows this man, some of my work yeah. about this, and so yeah. I asked her for help how to share a couple of actual maps so you can see how that uh, looks. I would love that. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Pam. We have um still um. Brian, Trevor, Marcus, Javier, and Elena waiting. So, Brian, would you like to start? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, first of all, Pat, I endorse all the positive comments of some of the other participants. Thank can you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. So, I'm wanting to go on about Stafford Beer's idea of pathological autopoiesis, which he has in. Uh, designing freedom, when he talks about how in a bureaucracy you can have an inner core that's a kind of parasite on the institution, right? It's hell-bent on their own survival, not in discharging the mission of the institution. Yes. You with me? I am with right. you. So supposing a lot of people in the institution you're talking about were very happy for the problem to be wicked and unsolvable. So they'd be assured of having their jobs continuing and being able to pay off their mortgage. I see your point. Right, so take an example. Uh, supposedly, gangs in Northern Ireland were very happy for the troubles to continue. Were the problem solved, they'd lose their purpose, you know, their... Um, their role as right. doing whatever they did, right? So, you know, um, so the question is, in these wicked problems, I mean, one example with drug addiction is Gabor Mate attributing it to trauma in children, which can be addressed uh, by therapeutic means. So supposedly, so suppose all the drug addicts were cured there was no more interest in having heroin or whatnot. Then suddenly the agencies would lose their roles. All the people would presumably be fired and they'd have difficulty paying off their mortgages and the banks might collapse, right? So is that a factor or is that a total fantasy? Well, I'm sure it's a factor. Right. Um, and what's interesting, too, is that for each of the agencies that were there, only a few of them have a dedicated mission towards drug trafficking. Many of them have much broader missions where they have a portion of what they do is in the drug trafficking area. So, so that's one nuance, right? So even within an organization, like an agency, the portion that does drugs, you know, will have competition with other portions of the agency for budgets. So they will have even within themselves this competition for paying mortgages, right? I want to keep my mission going. And then of course, then the agencies themselves, they have a lot of competition. And what I find is the competition, like you say, maybe in this inner core, um, but the people who are actually doing the work is surprisingly very much want to co cooperate. Um, in fact, they, they do all the time, but it's, it's I know a guy cooperation. Well, hold on a second. I know a guy over in DEA. DEA. And so they're one off. I know a guys for any collaboration. There's nothing structured about it. Right. But they do understand that, gee, I need to go talk to somebody over here. Um, but the core agency itself has has a self-interest for sure. And um, that's with any organization, because I found out in Chicago, too. You know, the school district has its own thing, right? And then the, the various people that are involved with, let's say the park district, surprisingly enough, does a lot of education in Chicago. Well, each of them were like, well, but you're taking on my role, right? You shouldn't be doing that because that's something the schools should do. Well, schools aren't doing it well enough, right? So yeah, there is a lot of that. And, and 
you know, I guess my opinion on looking at this is that we just can't throw our hands up and say, that's it, right? It's like, if we keep hammering on, well, let's learn about the problem, at least. Let's just learn about the problem together. Even if we don't go so far as to say, we're gonna create an interagency or reorganize in any way, but let's just learn about the problem. There is a sense that people will come forward a little bit further and say, oh my God, I realized that, yeah, we, we are doing a fantastic job on a small portion of the problem. And that, yes, this, you know, but yeah, I mean, sure, maybe there is a little bit of like, well, let's not really solve it because then what will we do then? I don't know that it's conscience, like a conscious thing, but subconsciously there is this, you know, there's, I mean, I worked at a national laboratory. I had that feeling against other national laboratories. The competition is real. And you're like, well, but we do it better, <laughs> you know, even if we're doing the same thing. So I understand what you're saying. And, and I just think that it maybe isn't quite that bad when it comes to problems that people really want to solve. But, you know, in the context of this problem, we did very much look at where could we get into, um, you know, uh, mental health, right? And of course, then the, the drug companies and the opium um, addictions. So we talked about those things. So we, a lot of things were either supply side or demand side. How are we going to come at this thing? Can we do both? So thank you. But yes, I understand what you're saying. And it's, it is a big problem, right? To, to look at interagencies is that there's a self-preservation issue. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Brian and Pam. Um, Marcus is gone, but we still have uh, Javier and Elena. So Javier. You are muted, Javier. You need to unmute. Pam, you are my hero because you did something that is very difficult. That is to get in there and talk to uh, government agencies uh, and uh, show them the potential of the VSM. That is quite an achievement and congratulations. Now, my next comment, I want you to comment on what I'm gonna say. Uh, to prepare for this uh, conference of yours, I went back to reread the Decision and Control of Stafford's book. And maybe I had assimilated it, but I had forgotten a lot, a lot. And I found that the first example that he uses to justify operations research is the example of a, a submarine and some depth charges and how they were being set up. And that was one of the first important interventions of operations research uh, during World War II, okay? So this takes me to the subject that I think is missing in the VSM, which is security. I think security should be added, and I've done so in what I call the universal management, to the VSM as an important uh, uh, systemic function that has to be there and work together to, with the rest of the VSM because it's inconceivable that you would have something viable that is not taking care of its own security, okay? The brain, the human body takes care of the brain by giving us a, a big, a, a strong, uh, uh, cranium, okay? So I, I have no doubt that you can map any government agency as a VSM for, the, for, for uh, finding the way it works and, it, it, and in how it uh, operates and make it efficient, okay? Uh, Steve Bruis has called these uh, agencies or these organizations uh, like uh, managed business units. But the question here is where, I'm going to give the example of the DEA. Where does the DEA fit in somebody else's organism? Okay. So as, 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 as far as I understand, the DEA means drug law enforcement administration. It's not drug enforcement, it's drug law enforcement, okay? But for short, 
drug enforcement. Fine. So then, when a Congress uh, uh, turns out a law, okay, we can map the whole state, the whole United States, and then Congress is a system four function, and the executive is a system three, and then you have the judiciary as a system three star that detects the anomalies or the errors in the system, and it's agencies like the DEA that pump information you know, into the judicial system and out comes some sort of action, uh, a sentence seen by the judicial system, and then go back to the executive to enforce the law, you know, and put the guy in jail physically, okay? So you have this circuit where the legislative, the executive, and the judicial branches of government have to be connected in order for people to go to jail. And the DEA or any of the agencies that you talk to and got involved is part of the error detection, okay? It's how the system detects people uh, violating the law, okay? So in that bigger picture, if the DEA is not able to influence the administration of justice because it belongs to the executive or because it's not part of the legislative, then you have this disconnection and the bigger number of agents that you get that are disconnected to the whole system, the bigger the mess that you're going to have. So you have a very big mess. You have a very big, not only super wicked problem, it's like an impossible problem, okay? In, in the conference in, in Waterloo, I try to point this out, uh, saying that, uh, that the whole judicial system doesn't work at all, okay? And in this case, you're trying to solve a problem that can not be solved if, if the security protection and health, uh, let's say the security function is not recognized by the VSM, because then you don't have this systemic function, which is itself recursive, and that can connect systemically all the different agencies that try to enforce all the different laws that have to do with narco-trafficking. The DA is just a little peanut, you know, in, in all that big mess, okay? It's, it's not, okay? And, and I was a friend of, uh, I have been a friend with Elaine Shannon, the, the lady that uh, the reporter who wrote about the Desperados book in the 80s about the killing of Agent Camarena. And she used to tell me that DEA agents complained about the fact that they were, who were working in Mexico had been forced to become witnesses of human rights violations because of torture. But then that information went nowhere, okay? Why? Because the bosses uh, up upstairs would not, you know, try to uh, force anything on Mexico. Okay, so then you have all this frustration where where people say, "Well, I'll, I'll go and, and do my job, but I give up in any shape or form of trying to fix things, really, because the polit politics gets involved." So. What I'm saying in essence is unless we use a viable system at the, at the highest levels of government and get the three main separation of powers functions connected in a way that makes sense, we're not going to go anywhere, okay? So you have to connect the lawmaking with the executive and the judicial systems in a way that really work and produce results. Yeah, no, I, that would I, be my comment. I mean, that would be certainly nirvana, right? Um, so, so I agree totally. And of course, that's a recursive level. Um, I have, you know, I'm just a small peanut. So, yes, I mean, I think that needs to be done. Now, on the other hand, um, I think if you take it a level lower, there is a lot of task force activity. So there is a lot of interagency activity that happens at the worker level, 
right? So this is the people who are actually doing things in the worker level. It, it depends on the task force, how much um, clout they have. So if a task force has some clout, it can actually influence behavior of other agencies in the sense that they're now part of a task force. And so, yeah, maybe they don't have to answer to every political, a political thing happening in their agency because they're in this task force. So my, since it was just a PhD project, I thought, well, let's at least hit that level. Because we know that there are people who are wanting to interact and wanting to work together. And we spend a lot of money on task forces. And what ends up happening is that they meet three times a year and they sit around the table and they don't ever come up with anything actionable. Could we at but least- you, you have been doing this, you know, this interagency coordination and everything. Of course, new information, information changes us and it will change the behavior of the people involved. And, and that is uh, one thing that you did, which is excellent, okay? but. What do, you, what do you think about the idea that security has to be one of the systemic functions of any viable system? And it's recursive and it has to be mapped out correctly. It's a really evocative idea because I, I do see that as being something that doesn't get addressed you know, directly or intentionally um, when looking at, because you take a different wicked problem if you want, just to kind of just imagine. Let's say we're taking a wicked problem like, um, you know, um, healthcare. The, you know. the staffer used to, uh, you know, uh, refrain from helping the military with his VSM studies and, and analysis and everything, be, because he was, uh, it, 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 you know, like against the use of force and all of that. But I, I, I think that. Operations research was born because of the war, of the effort to win the war. So it must be a very important function in viability. Well, the fact I'm, is that that's why operations research was born. Well, and think from there on, cybernetic. Security is much broader than military. So if we think of security in the, in the sense of food security, right? We can look at security in ways that are... are Securing the needs and providing the basic human needs, water and, and food, are also security issues. So, so yes, it doesn't of course, matter. of course, like, it's recursive. Yes. So I think that looking at security and, and health is is the our body security, our health. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, and I and I agree that at at the level above the agencies, that you know. G the VSM would be enlightening to at least if you if you don't feel like it could ever really come up with a you know here's how government would work perfectly, at least learning and understanding where it's broken or where we have the the discontinuous uh, that you were talking about between the different branches. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Javier, and um, and thank you, Pam. Uh, we have only five minutes left. Uh, Elena has been waiting for a long time and Brian have a final question. So last two questions, Elena. Uh, well, first, Pam, uh, thank you for a great presentation. And I think that that last line that you mentioned, uh, the line that says, we don't understand the problem unless we look at it together, that ought to be on a banner <laughs> <laughs> over top of any number of situations. Uh, but my question is, when you identified those seven most important intervention points, uh, did you identify any in indices that you might map uh, and set up some kind of a real-time reporting thing to notice, like, if, if there was more activity here and there was a slope change or a step change? Yeah. So, I mean, that became an issue for a lot of reasons. So metrics so that they can show their individual agencies that they're meeting some sort of goal um, is very hard when they're doing like a portion of an overall bigger goal. And so that gets a little bit to the attribution and to the recognition issue. It's not only that for their own careers they need to get recognized, but the agency itself. And this is something in the United States, agencies are run completely off of numbers number of arrests, you know, there's so many metrics that are used that mean nothing to the real problem. 
Um, and yet that's what they're driven by. And that's how agencies get, you know, funding. And that's how, you know, people decide whether the agency should even exist or not, right? So, so that is a really big problem that, that the group said when they came up with these interventions, which, which A, some of them had to lessen their role, right? Because DEA actually thinks that they're really, you know, doing everything. And there were some cases where they said, well, we could see where we would really want to have this happen, maybe more at the local level in the city itself, right? So, but the metrics became a real big issue because when we started talking about those things, a lot of the metrics were going to be fairly nuanced, right? Because, because of the fact that it's systemic, that it's going to affect something maybe indirectly by doing something over here indirectly over here. So yeah, I mean, I wish I had an answer for you, but it was something we talked about a lot and it was something they said was really important, but it it would take a lot more um, thought. When you start thinking systemically, metrics are completely different than when if you're just inside an agency and you're just looking at numbers, quick and easy numbers. Um, they themselves recognize that those numbers started having very little meaning when you looked at it systemically. Yeah, too, too often I think uh, metrics are based on what's easy to measure rather than what actually makes a difference. Exactly. That is a real problem. Right. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Brian, and then May, and then we'll stop. We'll stop because we are getting out of time now. Brian. Hello. Hey. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we do. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to share a comment that... Uh, was made to me by the head of an OR department I joined. It was my first job, and I was enthusiastic about the VSM. And Stafford Beer had visited this department, and the head of the department, George Bennett, uh, when I said, what do you think about the VSM? He said, I think it would take a big crisis for people to get serious about it. And I think in regard to climate change, which the scientists say, we now only have nine years before to halve emissions before it becomes irreversible is a crisis, don't you think? Well, it hasn't reached, in my opinion, the level of crisis that it should. It's starting to reach a level of crisis, but it's, it's not what it should be. And I agree that, that it should be a good example of where we need to come together and actually come up with a viable way of not only looking at yeah, because it's a really wicked problem, right? Because we don't, all, we have to slow down the change, but at the same time, we have to be adapting to the changes that are already happening. So, so the hope might be that as in the outbreak of World War II, um, all the kind of bureaucratic resistance might be swept aside and we might get serious about using something like the VSM. God, that would be so awesome. That would be really awesome. Now, I, I say... A small project I have right now is there's something called Doha Debates, and they have a fellowship program. So they take young people in their 20s from across the whole world into a fellowship where they start, they look at how to address really wicked problems. And I, I, I'm asked to, to kind of help them to do a systemic approach to it. So just teaching them, I mean, just kind of giving them. But that's where I think for me, you know, if we can get younger people aware of what the viable system model can do and how systemic thinking about this can be, that, that they're the ones, right, that I'm hoping will, will say this is a crisis and we're going to come together and we're going to work on this because I just feel like our generation is just like either we're throwing our hands up in there and say it's just too wicked or just too complex or you know, it's just like everyday things become more important than something that's that's happening and it's so hard to comprehend the future of that. So I guess it's just in, in, in saying that it's hopefully is that thing that will bring us all together, but hopefully younger, we can just get people more aware. I mean, here in the United States, we don't teach just some thinking in most universities. There's nothing. We're lucky if we can get a critical thinking course, right? It's all about analytics and about mathematics and about, you know, STEM, which is all great. But, but when these problems require so much more than that, we're not teaching people um, how to do this. And this is where I feel like to make a change, we have to start teaching it and opening younger people's minds to it. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, this has been really interesting. I think that the number of um, topics that um, your presentations open is um, is enormous, and it's really exciting. I mean, really, as Javier was, uh, was saying, we could go to the next level of recording. We could talk about you no know, the 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 role of the agencies. We could talk about so many different aspects. But really, I think that um, it's been a very rich conversation and. Uh, yeah, I I very very happy very happy to share your, your work with you and uh, and uh, anyway looking forward to see you again um in 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 the webinars the next one is gonna be we are now going once a month so the next one is gonna be Ro, um robin asby talking about his new book on systems and it's gonna be in, in october in the middle of october or something so thank you very much. If anyone wants Pam's presentation, just write to me and I'll liaise with, with Pam. And I will share Alfredo's um, information and anything else you want to share with, with everyone, okay? So thank you very much and um, have a good um, end of the week and uh, see you soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Pamela, can it be possible to have the contact details for Pamela? Yes, of course. I will. I will send you the contact details. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, Angela, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I sent you a couple of emails, but I just downstairs.